weekend. Amen. Amen. So God has given us a good weekend. So uh, God bless you this morning. I'm glad you're here. For those that are watching via our uh, Zoom or the virtually, we say thank you for watching. Thank you for joining in. And as I always say, call your friends. Yeah, you know what I'm going to say. <laughs> call them and let them know your favorite pastor is on there. Yeah. Tell them to tune in. God's got a word for us. Trust the love of God and believe. Why trust the love of God? You know, a lot of times people say that I trust you. You know, sometimes people don't trust you. They say they love you. That'd be a lie too. <laughs> But we want to trust the love of God. Jesus said it in the verse that we read, Matt, I mean, John 3, 16, for God so loved us that he did what? Gave. When somebody said they love you, you don't, you don't have to go very far. You watch the signs. You know whether they really love you or not. Amen? Amen. A woman will know whether a guy is into her, that little movie that shows you know, he's not into you like that. Isn't that what they call it? <laughs> She'll know whether he's into her like that by what he does. If she's got to always be calling him and he doesn't ever call her, he's not into you. <laughs> if he's always asking and begging you to give him something, but he don't ever give nothing to you, he's not into you like that, right? But the scripture says, for God loved us so much that he did what? He demonstrated it, didn't he? He gave, gave us the best that he had to his only begotten son. And it came with promise. It said, whoever would believe on him, we won't perish. He didn't say whoever get everything right every day. He didn't say that, did he? He didn't say those that always are faithful and always in church on time, you're going to be having everlasting. He didn't say that. He said, those who believeth on him. Now watch this. The caveat to that is, when you really believe something, you show it too, don't you? Mm -hmm. When my folks told me the stove was hot as a kid, and I walked there and I felt it, trying to prove it, check it out, see if they were telling the truth. And I touched that stove and I felt that heat. I believed what they said. And because of that belief, guess what? They didn't have to keep telling me don't touch this stove. Why? Because I believe now if I touch the stove, it's going to burn me. And that's the way it is with Christ. He said those who believeth on him will not perish. So now watch this. A part of believing is to do what the Lord says. Y'all get it? To believe on him is to be obedient to him. Why? Because I don't want to go to hell, <laughs> number one. And secondly, I don't want to be on the wrong side of God. Because he told us, if I'm for you, he says what? I'm more than the whole world against you. <laughs> I don't want to be on the wrong side of God. I want to be on his side because his side is the winning side, isn't it? His side is the winning side. If he's more than the world against me, that means he's more than my stocks and bonds. He's more than the best president I could ever have on this side. He's more than my enemies that fight against me. He says, if I'm for you, I'm more than the world against you. <laughs> now, brother, it don't get no better than that. So what I need to do, I need to believe on him, don't I? And a part of me believing on him is to believe him enough that I trust what his words say. And just like that kid, once they touched that stove and realized, yeah, it is hot, it shaped what I did from that point on. I didn't keep going back touching the stove, especially when there was fire in there because it was hot and it would do what? Burn me, right? And it's the same way in this Christian walk. You know, as 
ministers of the gospel and pastors and whatever, we don't have to keep telling people, don't do that. Oh, you shouldn't do that. No, 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 no. When you fall in love with Jesus and you believe on him, that shapes your actions. Y'all follow me? That shapes your beliefs and it shapes what you do and what you don't do. I remember back in the day, they'd be telling you, oh, you know, when you get saved, you can't do this and you can't do that. Well, you know, they meant well. But it's not what you can't do. Paul said, we have all liberty in Christ. In other words, I can do whatever I want to do. In Christ, I have freedom. So, Hicks, what are you saying? I don't do it because I fell in love with Jesus. Does that make sense? I fell in love with him, and I believe what he says. So, what are you saying, Pastor? You can come to church and still don't, be, don't believe like that, right? People can do all kinds of stuff, and they don't necessarily believe. I can come in here and sing and shout and hickle aside all day. But that don't mean I really believe in Jesus. Because when I really get to believe in Jesus, it's going to start shaping how I live. It's going to affect what I do. It's going to affect what I say. Why? Because I become cognizant of that. And because I'm in love with him, I don't want to offend him, right? I don't want to do anything that's going to jeopardize our relationship. What does it look like? I said, I love my wife. I love my wife. But every time you look, I want to talk to another woman. Y'all kick me out of here with you. You don't love her. You don't love her. Every time I look, you talking to somebody else on your phone. I'm going outside hiding, talking to somebody else on my phone. But baby, I love you. Jesus said, we're a liar. And the truth is not in us when we live like that, right? Y'all know that's what the word said, right? He said, I made him a lie and the truth is not in, him, in us. So my point is, let's trust the love of God to the point that we believe him. Now, I'm going to turn the corner a little bit. I want to say this while I'm thinking about it. Again, thank you guys for all the love and the kindness that you've shown to me on the Facebook. Somebody said, oh, you got a lot of uh, accolades on the Facebook from yesterday. I'm like, oh, okay, I got to look at it. And I looked at it last night, and I'm like, oh, man, I felt the love. I really, I really feel the love, not only from my own church family, but from friends and family that used to be here. Some have moved on, and some of my clergy friends sent their, con their uh, thanks and their gratitude. Congratulations. And uh, congratulations and all of that, and I'm so grateful. And uh, it's been a two year journey, but thank God I finally finished up my master's degree in clinical mental health counseling. You know, I'm almost like the doctor. <laughs> you can come to me, and I have my big Bible, my big book, my diagnostic manual. I can st you tell me what you're feeling and how you've been responding and what's going on with you. I'll tell you what's wrong with you. <laughs> oh, y'all <you're> laughing. <laughs> but yeah, sometimes you don't have to tell me. <laughs> so sometimes I can tell just by you talking to me. But I've been, I've been educated in such a way that I can, you know, the Bible talks about discerning things. Well, I've got a deeper discernment now. <laughs> Sometimes it's not what people say, it's what they don't say is the problem. Y'all know that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, uh, a master's degree in clinical mental health counseling. And because of all of the trauma and the grief and the anxiety that people are going through over these last several years, I just felt God was telling me. Because one time I was going to go ahead and get a degree, another degree in theology. One time I was going to get it in business administration to follow up with my business degree. But the Lord had been talking to me about getting a degree in counseling, mental health counseling. And I'm so glad I did. I'm so glad I did. Uh, you'll be surprised at the people that 
since I had this degree, and even before I got the degree, because we had to go through internship, and I'm still doing some of that. But the people that you run into with all sorts of situations, emotional situations, traumatic situations, and uh, God has blessed me. I've been able to minister to a lot of those, and I'm so grateful. Let me just insert this parenthetically. A lot of times when people hear the word mental health, First thing that come to most people's mind is, oh, they crazy. <laughs> you don't know I'm right. Oh, they crazy. They wacko. Uh, you know. But that's not necessarily the truth. No, most of the time, that's not true. Mental health does not mean that you are crazy. Now, there, don't, don't get me wrong. There's, there's a category for you. <laughs> But it doesn't necessarily mean that a person is crazy. But mental health is one's condition in regards to their psychological and emotional state of being. Psycho, you know, mind. Emotional, you know, what you what you're feeling. You know, I feel. Yes, yeah, somebody you feel. I feel like I don't a burst. Somebody told me the other day, I feel like my heart been about to burst out in my chest. Emotional. And a lot of times these emotions and feelings and your mindsets could be predicated upon what you're going through now. It could be temporary or it could be something long term. For example, somebody had a death in their family. All of a sudden their anxiety level goes up and they're all, you know, that could be a temporary fix because as they deal with that grief and pain and over a few months sometime, that anxiety will subside, right? It goes away. But now if you have some other deeper issue, and this could be something that happened to you when you were a child. It could be something that happened to you when you was 18. And you never had it dealt with. You never sat down and, and been able to let somebody minister and help you work through that. That can be a long-term effect upon you. And you can go years and years in and out of relationships, in and out of situations, and all kind of stuff, and the wheel just keeps revolving. And it could be, somebody say it could be sometimes. Maybe stuff that you just have not dealt with internally, emotionally, you just never dealt with. It. You just put it in your little bag and hid it away. You ever, you ever hide stuff? Forget where you hide it. Forget where you place it. Only at times when you really need it, you start thinking, where did it, where did it go? Where did it go? Well, that's the way it is emotionally. When you hide it back and you try to cover it up, eventually it's going to evolve and show itself. How does it show itself? It'll manifest itself. If I run into another person that's similar to what I went through back whenever, all of a sudden it's going to trigger something. Now, I can't have a decent relationship with you or my wife because I'm hysterical about that. And, and you know, it looks like you're going to do me what somebody else did to me. And now, all of a sudden, now I got a bunch of drama going on with myself. <laughs> that don't mean you're crazy. Y'all hear me? It simply means you have some situations, some issues you need to deal with in order to have a more effective relationship and not only with others, but even with yourself. Anybody ever had a problem with yourself? You ever just hate yourself? Man, why did I do that again? You ever seen people do that? They got some issues that they haven't dealt with most of the time. They get upset with themselves because why? I find myself doing the same thing over and over and over again. That don't mean you're crazy. Sometimes. <laughs> I'm moving on. I'm gonna give y'all, I'm giving y'all a preface today. Now this is I got a lot I can tell you. I'm giving you a preface today, so. I'm going to do this, and, and I get the clock says it's time to move forward. I'm going to stop, and I'll, I'll table it to, for another time, all right? Yes. So then, the trauma and the grief and the pain, 
many have experienced due to gun violence or the COVID issues or deaths. And even those men and women suffering from military experience, from post-traumatic stress disorders. That's real too. And my heart goes out to all of our military friends and those I know and those that I don't know. Because a lot of times, depending on what you have been involved with during your time or your tenure in the military, you too could have been suffering from PTSD, is what the term is called. And I sympathize with you. I've even met with some of those clients and have been ministering to some of them. And uh, there is good help for you. Don't let nobody tell you, oh, you're going to always have that issue. You're going to always be traumatized. No, there is good help out here for you. So uh, if you need some direction, come and see. With my master's in clinical counseling, I am now able to diagnose mental health issues. Again, don't think that's for the crazy people. I'm able to assess and propose treatment. The term mental does not always mean one is lunatic or crazy. It may mean the emotional or psychological reasoning has been tampered with, impaired due to possible past negative or harmful experiences. When our belief system of values become compromised, y'all hear this, we no longer believe or perceive in a rational kind of way. Okay? Therapists like myself help one identify flawed thinking and flawed beliefs. And we help you to reorient and redirect those maladaptive thoughts so that you get back to the normal place so you can live your life in a good way. Amen? Amen. That's what we do. I do believe clinical counseling is an extension of the hand of God. I believe that. And for a long time, I think even churches and clergymen did not see it in that light. But I believe counseling is an extension of the hand of Christ on the earth. Because Jesus said it this way in John 14 and 12, Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, you gonna do. But then he said, but greater works shall you do. Right? And he said, because I'm going back to my father, and I'm gonna be the intercessor, I'm gonna be an advocate for you as you do your work of God's work on the earth. Yeah. What was Jesus saying? Again, I believe he was saying, I am providing all sorts of situations, behaviors, and models or ways to treat various conditions. Because if you remember, he did not minister healing the same way every time. Did he not? He didn't lay hands on everybody and say, now nah, you're healed. He didn't do that every time. So, why didn't he do it every time? Even in the Old Testament. Y'all remember? Naaman? Naaman? He had a problem. He was a major general. He wasn't in the Navy. I think he was in the uh, Army or something. <laughs> But Naaman had an issue. He was big and high up on the echelon in his in, in the military, but the Bible said he had a he had leprosy, right? And the prophet, he didn't uh, tell him, come to me and I'm gonna lay hands on you. You know what I mean? The prophet sent a word to him. And what the word said, he said. Go down there into that Jordan River and wash seven times. Why did he tell him that? Rather than saying, oh, I'm just going to come where you are and just going to let you kneel down and I'm going to pray the prayer of faith. He could have did that and he would have been healed. So he must have had more, more than just a spiritual problem. Or else he could have, the Lord could have just healed him right there. Where he, come on in here, buddy. Let me lay hands on you. He had a pride problem. He was probably high-minded. So 
So the Lord said, I'm just not going to deal with spiritual issues. I'm going to deal with all of you. That's why the Lord often used the term, do you want to be made whole? Y'all follow me? In other words, if a man was blind, you could use heal the blind man, his physical ailment to heal his eyes. But if he's not, if he's not emotionally stable on the inside, he's not whole, right? He still got some issues. And a lot of times people today, you know, oh, I just want you to fix this problem here. That that one man. Oh, he was out begging for arms. And Peter and those guys came to him, hey, we don't have any silver and gold for you, man. Silver and gold we don't have. But in the name of Jesus. And they ministered to what he really needed. Sometimes we are in that same kind of situation, right? Sometimes we think we need certain things, but the real issue is something else. <laughs> That's why we have clinical counseling. <laughs> I'll just sit down with him, just let you talk to me like the doctors do. And after a few minutes, I can probably tell you <laughs> Whether you need money or whether you need to discipline your life. Y'all don't get it. Y'all look at me funny. But it's the truth. Most of our problems are not what we think the problem is. Yeah, moving on. Jesus did not heal everyone the same way, as I said. Some he told to go wash in the pool of Siloam. When he believed and went, he returned seeing. So I wonder, did he have more than just a physical sight problem? John 9 and 7. Maybe this person had a flawed belief of who Jesus really was. So Jesus said, well, I'm going to give you an order and see if you go follow it. If you really believe me, you go do it. Same way it is living for the Lord. If I really believe him, I'll strive to do what he's saying, right? I won't keep making excuses. Or, or, oh, I won't do it tomorrow. Oh, next week, maybe when I get around to it. No. If I really believe what the Lord is saying, I'll strive to be faithful to him. That makes sense? When I took this job, I remember when I took my first job, you know. Oh, God help me. It wasn't paid nothing. I was trying to go to college and get my bachelor's degree. I took on this little job that we had a, a place in our little city called Lifetime Doors. They put doors together. They sent doors all over the country. Had another little place there they called Sunbeam. They made all kinds of appliances, kitchen appliances. And I worked at both of those places. But you know what? They told me what they were going to pay me an hour. Hardly nothing, and I didn't like it. But I believed they were going to pay me. So you know what? Because I believed that, like my parents taught me, I showed up to work every day. I told them I was going to be there. I worked the hours that they told me that I needed to work because I believed that they were going to do what? Give me my check. My parents didn't have to say, oh, now you need to get up and go to work now because they're not going to pay you. They didn't have to say, oh, you need to stay the full eight hours or they're not going to pay you. No, I did it because what? I believed in what they told me. I believed it. And I believe God is saying today, if we really love him and believe him, We'll do what he said, and nobody's going to have to chase you down. Nobody's going to have to run and put a saddle on you. All right, son, come on now. You know this is the day. Come on now. So like my son, he got his first job. <laughs> he got his first job working at the Chick-fil-A. What was he, about 15? And they took a risk to hire him because, you know, 15, and they said most teenagers aren't mature enough to work. I'm like, yeah, he's, he's mature enough to work. <laughs> he started to ask for more money. <laughs> I know he's mature enough to work. So the guy said, God bless his heart. Brett, he passed away not long ago, but he took a chance and gave James a job, his first real job. And James worked about a week. He 
he come on dirty flour all over him and stuff. He was all dirty, all in his head. He says, uh, he worked for a week or two, and he says, uh, Dad, you know, the disciples be making fun of him. Oh, you got a flower. Look at you, man. You dirty. You need to go in and take your shower. Look at you. So James came to me one day. He said, Dad, you know, I think I'm going to quit. They got me doing all of the dirty jobs. <laughs> and he was all over the place. Back there in the kitchen and scrubbing and cleaning and all kind of stuff. And uh, I'm like, oh, man. I'm like, yeah, I know that's kind of hard, isn't it, son? He said, yeah, but it's just not worth it. <laughs> and I'm like, I said, oh man, I can see. I said, yeah, I know you can. You, they must put you through it because you all dirty when you come home. I was agreeing with him. I said, but you know what, son? I said, why don't you do this? Let's do this. Uh, I said, why don't you wait till you get your first check? I said, just give it a few more days. Get your check. Get your first check. And if you really want to quit, then what I said, then you can just quit. I mean, just quit. I said, oh. Wait till you get your first check, though. And he agreed. He said, oh, all right, then. I'll, I'll, I'll wait. I'll hang in there a few more days. Because, you know, the first week, <clears throat> I don't know if they do it now. They used to hold back a week before they was paid, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, long story short, when he got that first check, it wasn't a whole lot. But you know what? <laughs> he never did complain about quitting anymore. <laughs> I was kind of expecting maybe you'd come back and say, well, Dad, I'm giving it up. Now, you told me if I could write another, you know, till I get my first check. He didn't mention it anymore. Why? I believe he, he, he felt something. He said, you know what? Well, they did say they were going to pay me. And I've got, I didn't make a whole lot of hours, and I made this much. So maybe if I work a few more hours, I might even make a little more. He never talked about quitting with me again. Because he believed that what they had promised, they were going to do it. Plus, he get to bring home some chicken every night. So what am, I, what am I saying? What am I saying? I'm saying that our belief system has a lot to do with our actions. Our belief system has a lot to do with our actions. A lot of times people look at the actions, what people are doing, what they're doing. Or they said this, and they did this, or they did that. But little, most of the time, it's not so much about what they're doing here. I always tell us, you know, I tell you all this all the time, roll the tape back, just roll the tape back a little bit further, and you'll see why they are doing what they are doing. That's my job as a therapist and as a pastor. I've counseled people over and over for a lot of years. My wife and I, we've did all kind of counseling, and we've talked to a lot of people. But most of the time, their problem is not what they're doing right now. Of course, it's related. But most of the time, Brother Stephen, it's stemming from something that happened back when. Our job as counselors are to help you connect the dots. And we can help you connect the dots. You begin to tell yourself what your problem is. Don't need me to tell you. I just kind of guide you through it and help you through a series of questioning, help you to come up with your own answer. And you know what? Most people are smart enough to do it. Same thing you do when you go to the doctor's office. What are you feeling? Where you heard at? When I press here, do you feel it? <laughs> They ask you a series of questions. And then they bill you a big old. <laughs> you are paying them. But you are answering your own questions. And then they write you a prescription. This costs you some more money. But my bottom line is, most of the time, our actions are predicated upon our belief system. Our belief system, a lot of times, is flawed. Why is it flawed, Pastor? From your environment, from what you were always told, from what you've seen, sometimes even what you live through. All of that shapes the way you think, the way you think. And it shapes your belief system. 
The Bible told James back in the day when he wanted to quit that job. Oh, just quit, man. Don't worry about it. Just quit. It's okay. And guess what would have happened? Probably not. He would have taken on another job. Maybe. And when he got on another job, he didn't like it. Guess what he would have done? Come to daddy. Daddy, I don't like it. Oh, hey, just quit, son. It's okay. Daddy got you. Then he went to another, maybe he would have went to a third job. You might have just sit home and say, all right, Daddy. You told me it's okay, so uh, I still need some money, though. His belief system would have been affected drastically. And guess what would have been happening at 40 or whatever age he is now? Hey, Dad, you told me you were good. Y'all follow what I'm saying? His belief system would have been flawed because of what I told him. Then I'd be wondering, Harry is at 40. Why will he keep it? Why don't he keep a job? Why can't he work and make his own living? You see what I'm saying? It's not what he's doing now. Roll back the tape and you will see exactly why he's doing that. Many times all we want to deal with is what's happening now. Oh, yeah, but right now, oh, baby, I'm going to pay for you. And sometimes we try to bail them out every time while they're going through this stuff. But roll back the tape and deal with the real issue and minister from there. Then you can help a person. That makes sense? I believe that's what Jesus did. That's what Jesus did. He would ask questions. Y'all remember the woman he met at the well? He didn't, first of all, the Jews and the Samaritans had no dealings with each other, but Jesus went purposely and sat there and waited. And when the woman came, he started having a dialogue with her, didn't he? And he didn't start out by saying, you need to be saved. You're a hypocrite. You're a liar. You're a cheater. No, he asked us some questions. He asked us, so where are your husband? <laughs> it's an innocent question, right? Because I'm sure she was of age. She could have been married. And she said, oh, I don't have one. And in a nice way, well, you know, you said it right. <laughs> he agreed with her. That's what counselors do. We sit and ask you questions and let you agree with us. And then we say, oh, so this is the problem. She said, he said, no, I know you're right. You said it right. You don't have one because you already had five. And the one you had now is not yours, right? You must be a prophet. <laughs> she didn't stop cursing at it and throwing sticks. Oh, man, you were brilliant. You must be a prophet. No, I'm just a counselor. <laughs> but it changed her life. Amen. It changed her life. The Bible says, in other words, she became like a little advantage. She went back and told all of these other, she probably included those four or five men that she was with before. But y'all need to go see a man because he'll tell you exactly what you did wrong. He can help you. And folks, that's the same kind of lifestyle Christians supposed to have today. When people come to us, we don't have to indulge, indulge in their gossip and, and all of this other craziness. We just sit there and, and have dialogue with them and be present with them and listen to them and share with them and let them share with you. And then you help them to solve their own issues. But what do we do most of the time? First time they tell us what's wrong, we agree with them. They're frustrated with their church. Yeah, I guess you ought to just leave job. That guy would have told James. I told him just leave him. Without trying to figure out what's really going on. Right? That's how we do as parents, right? I hope that's how we raise our kids. We didn't just let them come up with their story. Oh, I don't like the teacher. <laughs> when I was teaching at the high school across the street, I would hear that regularly. Oh, I don't like my teacher. I didn't just tell her, you don't like it. Oh, yeah, you're going to give you a slip to get a transfer from her to somebody. No, I didn't live like that. Come on, let's sit down and talk about this. Now, why? what's going on? Tell me what's going on. He mean. He don't like me because I'm black. 
And I'm just telling you the truth. Mm -hmm. And I sat down and tell him, I said, okay, well, how do you come up with that? I said, just imagine, because I said, what time do you normally get to your class? Mm -hmm. I get there before the bell ring. I said, is that what you require? Well, she wants us to be in our seat before the bell ring. But I get that. I'm in, the, I'm in my seat. I'm in the door when the bell ring. You know, and she don't like that. Okay. Oh, so that's a problem, right? <laughs> she wants you to be in your seat when the bell ring, but you're just coming through the door. Well, that's how my other teacher left me. My other teacher don't complain about that. Wait a minute. Oh, okay. You think there are two, two different people? You think they have two different criteria? Yeah, I guess so. Well, when you get your job and you start working out in life, you think you, all your supervisors are going to be the same? Oh, probably not. Okay. So, you're getting some practical experience of what real life is about. What do you think about that? Oh, yeah, I guess you're right. My point is, what people say is not always where they are. I believe God is calling us to be as Christ. When we're interacting with people, and we will, right? But it's in our neighborhood, on our job, uh, in church. You're interacting with people, right? You're interacting with people. And sometimes, somebody say sometimes, they are not always as centered as we would like them to be. Right? Or sometimes, we're not always as centered as we ought to be either, right? Any event can happen in any of our life today. And all of a sudden, we have shifted. Our mindset, our cognition, where we are thinking, it starts running a thousand miles an hour. And all of a sudden now, we might not respond exactly like we would normally respond had that not been in our life. Does that make sense? So the question comes again is, I should not be too quick to judge my neighbor. Because most of the time, I don't have a clue what's going on. Y'all heard that? Didn't Jesus say that too? Judge not, so you won't be judged. Because sometimes, if I say sometimes, we can judge somebody on the surface based on their actions right now, but that's not them. That's not really what's going on with them. But if I judge them, and all of a sudden I go and tell this person, you know, so-and-so, man, they this and they that. And I go and tell somebody else, oh, this person got this, or they did this, and they did that. Now I'm dragging their name, especially if it's derogatory and negative stuff, I'm dragging them through the mud when I shouldn't even be mentioning their name in that kind of way. Because how would you, if the shoe was on the other foot, how would you want people to respond to you? You had a one bad day, and all of a sudden, oh, man, they don't do what they're supposed to do. They don't do that, or they don't do that. And all of a sudden, now you got five other people that come in on agreement with you over something crazy that's not even accurate. But no, we don't do that, do we? Christians don't live there, right? Y'all looking at me strange. <laughs> Sometimes we live there, don't we? And we have forced or caused others to come in agreement with us against someone or something that's not even real. And we have to say, if we're honest with ourselves, we have to say, and Lord, forgive me as I forgive those. Because <laughs> it happens, doesn't it? Everybody ought to just rock your head. It's okay. It's all right. It's good therapy this morning. It's all right. <laughs> when you leave here, you're going to feel better about yourself. I guarantee you. Because I'm not here with a whip. I'm just here to expose and to show us some things 
that sometimes, somebody say sometimes, sometimes. even we're not aware of ourselves, man. Sometimes it's my wife that brings the reality to me, and I hadn't even noticed it. Sometimes I bring reality to her on something that she probably hadn't even noticed. Why? Because we are one, right? The two, the Bible says, becomes one. It's not like we're against each other. So I know this, but I'm not going to tell her. I'm going to keep this to myself because I know she's going to run into it sooner or later, and it's going to hurt her. No. We don't live like that, do we? If I know something that's going to be detrimental to her, I let her know. And vice versa. She knows that, you know, we walk into the mall and she says, you know, I see that woman looking at you. <laughs> oh, dish. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody said it happens. Oh, me too. I know it <laughs> But the bottom line is we are helpers one of another, and it doesn't matter what race you are, what creed you are, what ethnicity you're from. It doesn't matter what culture. We are here to help one another, right? Y'all hear me now. My job is to help you. Your job is to help me in my neighborhood. I try to get to know my neighbor. Because one day I might need my neighbor. And people say to me, oh, we don't, we don't get the people in deeper business like that. Oh, that's probably where y'all did it. But we don't do that no more. We don't need to know that name. We don't need to speak to them because people don't want you to be speaking to them. Wow, hogwash. <laughs> Why I say that? Because the Lord has given me something that I can share that will help you. And if you're a real Christian that you say you are, he's deposited something in you that you can help somebody else. But guess what? If we walk around all the time and don't say nothing, oh, because they, you know, they, they, they don't want to be bothered. Oh, they got something else on their mind, so I'm not going to say nothing. Then I walk in, people I walk around and see people all day. Don't care if I'm walking in the store or walking in to do something. Oh, how you doing? Sometimes they try that like they don't want to see me. <laughs> and they start playing with their phone like they're trying to take that little bitch. I still say, oh, how you doing today? It's a nice day, isn't it? There's no law against that. Just showing love, right? Now, if I ask y'all how many of y'all do that, y'all head probably go down. <laughs> I stay out of people's business, Pastor. I don't know who my neighbor is. I don't even know what kind. I don't just get in their business like that. No, I purposely go out there. When I see the car coming in the yard, I purposely go out there sometimes. Oh, so how you doing today? I know their name. I know their address. <laughs> Got their phone number in my book. <laughs> so if anything happens and they're not there, at least I can call them and tell them because we are neighbors. Let's trust the love of God and believe. If he said by this love, everybody's going to know that you are my disciples, let's prove it. Let's put God to the test. Because a lot of times you can have an issue. But if you're too proud or you've been talking, oh, just stay to yourself. Don't, don't, don't put people in your problems, in your business. God will have the answer right there all around you all day. If you're too afraid or too shame or you got too much pride to ask for help, then you get angry when it doesn't work out because I thought the Lord was where the Lord was working it out, but you wouldn't accept it. That makes sense. I don't want to be one blaming God because listen, God, He's the perfect God. Even if I blame Him, it don't make no sense. It's not going to make any difference. He's going to do just like the therapist, just sit there. Keep asking you questions and asking you questions and let you form your own answer. Because, you know, when you tell people what to do, most of us, <laughs> oh, you tell me I'm not doing that. You're not my mama, my daddy. Some grown people still say that. You know that? <laughs> Some of y'all probably still say that. I don't know who that pastor think he is. He's not my daddy. That's why we don't as a therapist, I don't try to be your daddy. <laughs> I just ask you questions. Let you be your own judge. <laughs> and when people come up with their own answer, I just guide you into it. But when you come up with your own answer, then you don't blame me. 
My son came up with their own answer. He decided, I'm just going to keep on working. You think the flower went away off of his clothes immediately? No. You think he, they stopped giving him the dirty job? No. But since he came up with his own answer, he owned up to it. He just stayed there and did it. And guess what? Five years later, he was still there. <laughs> Because he graduated and got him a real job. A better job, not a real job. That wasn't a real job. But my point is, our belief system will affect the way we think, the way we act, the way we respond to other people. Our belief system will dictate all of that. And whether we face it or not, we can. I would rather face it now and make my life better as I walk than to live my life 50, 60, 70 years and then talk, talk about what I could have, would have, should have done. I think that causes more drama when you live your life in reverse looking back at what I should have, could have, or what I would have done. Many of you would go back to school too, but you start there thinking and listening to your friend. Child, it's hard. Yes, it is hard. You know what? You got other things to do now. Why would you go back to school? Talk yourself directly out of doing what you feel that you ought to be doing yourself. Anybody in the house? Why not sometimes listen to your own person? Listen to that spirit that's speaking to you. Because the Lord going to speak to you. You might not listen to it, might not want to do it today. But he'll keep on speaking to you. And if he's keep on, if he continues to speak to you, you ought to sometimes, somewhere down that path, begin to say, wait a minute. Maybe the Lord is telling me to do this. And if everybody else is telling you no, 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 chances are it's God. <laughs> if everybody in your little circle, and a lot of times we, we have a few friends in our circle, and we confide in them, you tell them stuff you don't tell your mama. <laughs> but if anybody in your little circle, every time you come up with a good idea, they say, oh, no, I know that sounds good. You can't do that. No, you, that never happened. Nobody in your family ever did that. No, 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 no. You don't make enough money. No, you don't have this. You don't have that. You probably should do it. Because misery loves company. And if I'm not doing much with my life, and you're supposed to be my bestest friend, and you decide you want to do more with your life, guess what? I don't want to be by myself. Oh, child, that won't work. I know he seemed like a nice guy, but he don't. I don't think he wants you like that. Nah, no. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't let him in. You be just come on. I could be bestest friends. You can be bestest friends by yourself. I want what's best for my life. Anybody out there? I'm gonna stop right here. But listen, let's trust the love of God. And if you learn to trust the love of God, you start believing what the Lord is saying. Most people don't trust the love of God because they done been in relationships and people didn't show. They say they love me. But I watched them and they, they start deceiving me. They did stupid stuff. And all of a sudden, I saw them with somebody else. They said they love me, you know. That forms a maladaptive kind of belief system in our head. And when it comes to trusting the love of God, we have a problem with it. But you know, I had five people in my life and all five of them lied to me, cheated on me, did whatever. And now you're talking about the love of God. He's a good father. You know, people, that's hard to equate. Because the last, my father, my natural father walked out on me. My natural whatever, they didn't treat me right. They abused me. So now you're talking about the love of God. He's my father. Wonder what he's going to do to me. A lot of times people have a problem getting past that. And that's okay. That's okay. That's why God sent me here to help us get through it and move forward in our life. Because I believe God wants all of us to do good. Y'all believe that? Amen. Oh, I got a lot of amens there. So y'all do believe he wants all of us to do good. So do you trust the love of God? Uh oh, calm it down on that. <laughs> And that's okay, too. It's perfectly okay. And it's even more better because the first thing God wants us to be honest with ourselves. I can't be honest with him if I'm not honest with myself. 
certain pitfalls that I went through as a teenager and in my early 20s. I talked to him when he was coming through there because I give him books to read and try to encourage him because I didn't want him to make the same mistake. But if I didn't do that, and all of a sudden he started running into all these crazy things and situations happening with the girls and the this and the that, all of a sudden he would have all kind of doubt in his head because now he's got a flawed system because daddy didn't tell him nothing, mama didn't share much with him, and all of a sudden he finds himself dealing with it all on his own. Guess where he's going to go? Like some of y'all, go to his old friends and ask them, and you know, if they had the same situation, guess what they're going to tell him? So the cycle keeps continuing, right? Mm -hmm. So it's how we think and what we believe that's going to help us get to a good place. But it's, if it's flawed already, church, I don't care, you can be in church all your life. But if you're going to deal with that, you don't go nowhere fast. Yeah. You'd be one of those persons on your deathbed, huh? Yeah, I had a chance to do such and such. I wish I could, though. You know, Bobo did it. And it turned out good for him. And we were cheering Bobo on because he got to a good place. Bobo, what about you? God wants you to get to a good place too. He wants you to own several houses. He don't want you to just rent or own this. You know, Josh, I don't have but one. And oh, it's a struggle. Now, wait a minute. Do you believe the word or not? Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burdens are light. If yours is too heavy, Maybe you're not believing God like you're supposed to. Amen, somebody. Amen. Amen. So I'm challenging us this morning, and I'm going to finish this. This is part one. <laughs> I'm challenging all of us. Let's strive to trust the love of God. Even if you had some bad examples in your life, let's strive to learn to trust the love of God. And as we trust his love, Let's start believing him. Let's start believing him. When I started this degree, man, it took everything in me to do it because I was supposed to do it 20 years ago. I was there to help all my kids get through school. All my, my wife, when we went back, we, supposed to, we started back together. Then we started the ministry. And I said, well, you know what? I was making A's. And I said, well, you know what? I think God want me to just be at the church and be able to focus on one thing at a time. <clears throat> And I dropped out and told him I'm not coming back. <laughs> but I also think God didn't want me to necessarily major in business again. Because as I walked and observed, I believe I'm exactly where he wants me to do. I'm doing exactly what he wanted me to do. Was it hard? Yeah. Was it a challenge? Yeah. But I tell you what, I'd do it all over again if I had to. Because I believe this is where God wants me. Is that okay? Amen. So God bless you. I'm going to stop him right here. And uh, I hope you get something out of this. And listen, this is not a message to, to condemn anybody or make you feel bad. But this is a message of enlightenment. Mm -hmm. Do you think you've been enlightened anyway at all Amen. this morning? Amen. And, uh, you know, it's enlightening to me. And I'm still being enlightened. And I'm still growing and learning. And I'm not ashamed to admit that. And all of us should be willing to say, Lord, I know certain things, but I'm willing to learn more. I understand certain things, but I want you to continue to illuminate me. Give me more revelation of your word. Because a lot of times, like I said, church folk for a long time, they didn't even believe that people had, if you were a Christian, you didn't supposed to have no kind of emotional problems. You're supposed to be okay. And the only thing that we was come up to the altar, let me lay hands on you, that's it. But Jesus did more than that, didn't he? He had so many different ways of bringing people into wholeness and into healing and into a good place emotionally with themselves. And he did it well. And it's my desire. Anybody come to this church, I'm not just here to give you the spiritual side and tell you to just pray. You go and you just pray now. Oh, you know what? I'm having this struggle and I'm having this crazy dream tonight. Just pray. Just pray. Read your Bible some more. <laughs> That's good. But the Lord wants to, us to do more than just that, right? Because Jesus used all sorts of modalities and all sorts of ways to bring people into their healing. 
And I believe it's incumbent upon us to do the same so that people can be made whole and have a well-balanced life and enjoy your life. What is to have all of the money and the nice house and the nice car, but you and your wife don't speak to each other, just kind of going past it, you know. I don't think that's the best. Oh, my stocks are doing good, though. My stocks are doing good, though. I'm worshiping my stocks. But every morning before I pray, I'm looking at my stocks. I don't think that's God's best. I don't think just because, you know, I, I got a husband, he ain't worth much. <laughs> but I got him. And we had to say, one bird in the hand is better than one, two in the bush or some craziness. <laughs> Let's strive to live in good harmony with ourselves. And that way we can live in good harmony with somebody else, right? Mm -hmm. And for those of you that are single, listen, don't worry about being married. Just work on your singleness and let God continue to mold you and shape you. Because I guarantee you, just like he's preparing somebody for you, he wants you to be preparing for that somebody that he's preparing for you. It wouldn't make much sense if I'm just going to sit here and I'm not going to try to be my best. I'm just going to be average and mediocre. But I want God to send me your best one, Lord. He didn't answer that prayer for me until I start trying to be my best for him. Amen. Then he sent me one of his best. Because I asked him, Lord, send me one of the best women you've got. Because I could be a tough cookie sometimes. I don't want to buy it. Oh, I did love you, but I don't love you no more, huh? <laughs> but God loves all of us. Y'all believe he loves you? Y'all believe he's got a good plan for your life? Amen. And he wants you to walk into that plan. He doesn't force you now. He didn't force me to go back to school. I had to make up my mind that that's what I'm going to do. Right. He's not going to force you. <clears throat> but when he's got something in your heart, and he's continually, every so often he brings it back up to you, you need to sit there and ponder that. And say, Lord, is that really you? It's okay to ask the Lord questions. Lord, is that what you really want me to do? Then show me how to get it done. All he looks for is a willing heart. And if you say, Lord, I'm willing, the Lord will help you put your life together. He'll help you get to a good place. Let me pray for you. Father, again, in the name of Jesus, we're so grateful for the privilege to serve in the kingdom. Even now, at my age, I can still look at my life and sometimes I say, oh man, I should be better at this, I should be better at that. But I can say one thing, I'm not who I used to be, and thank God, you brought me a long way, and I still got a ways to go. But even with my situation, I want to be able to help others improve their life. I pray that as they come in these doors, as they come into the counseling center doors, help me to use the same grace, empathy, and mercy that you've shown to me. And let us be our best selves, even as we help others to get to a good place in their life. I pray that your peace, your grace, will be upon all of us. Inspire us, Lord. Use me to inspire us to not only just expect greater, but look for it, but to be willing to step out in faith. Let us trust the love of God, even as we believe. We bless your name for it all. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Y'all got something out of the word? I'm not going to ask you to give you a joy. <laughs> Maybe you might not have enjoyed it, but did you get something out of the word?